As we have come through this book of Romans, the Apostle Paul has spent quite a bit of time talking about the depravity of mankind. We saw it, first of all, in chapter 1, how he showed the sinful condition of the Gentile world, and he, he, he showed all of the things that the Gentiles were were involved in. And then in chapter 2, you remember, he showed, he showed the condition of the Jewish world and, and the sinful condition that was there. In fact, bottom line, the Apostle Paul has made it painfully clear that the depravity of mankind crosses all boundaries. The, the depravity of man, it crosses all, all boundaries. It has infected men of every nation. It has infected men of every race. It has infected men of every tongue, of every creed. In fact, you cannot find any man living on the face of this earth who has not been infected by this, by this thing called sin. The depravity of man. And, and that's a frightening thought. That's a frightening thought when we remember that while, while he was recording his visions of, of things to come in the book of the Revelation, you remember? John saw all of the things that are still yet in our future. Uh, things that are going to haven't happened yet, but they're going to happen. And as John was writing all of those things down, he was allowed to, he was allowed to get a little glimpse of heaven. To get a little glimpse of heaven. I don't know what it's like. John gives us a little bit of an idea. Remember when my, when my dad was coming down to the last hours of his life, my, my niece was sitting up with him. She's a registered nurse. And so she was sitting up with him and caring for him. And he was kind of, he was kind of out of it. And, and she said that all of a sudden his eyes just opened up and he said, Aaron, which was kind of a shock because he got her name right. But, but he said, Aaron. And she said, what is it, Papa? And he said, it's so beautiful over there. Now, I don't know what he saw. But, but what glories heaven must have in store for us. But because of the fact that all men are sinners, as John saw that beautiful city, he gave a terrible, he gave a terrible truth. Look at it in chapter 21, verse 27, the book of Revelation. He said, there shall in no wise, that means under no circumstances, under no condition, there shall in no wise enter into it. What? what? Enter into what? Heaven? No, under no condition, under no wise, will any enter into it anything that defile it. What, what does that mean? That means anything that is contrary to God's perfect righteousness will never be allowed to enter. Not only that which defileth, but neither whatsoever worketh abomination. In other words, nothing that offends the perfect holiness of God is going to be allowed to enter. Or that maketh a lie. In other words, nothing is going to be allowed to enter into heaven that rejects God's truth and chooses to follow their own truth as we saw back in Romans chapter 1. Who's going to be be able to enter into that place? Here's who can enter. They which are written in the Lamb's book of life. They are the ones who will be able to enter that place. They're the ones who will be able to enter. You see, God is perfectly holy. God demands absolute righteousness of those who are going to dwell in His presence. And the only way that sinful men can be made fit for heaven is by having their sins washed away, as we sang about just a moment ago. By the way, great choice of songs to go along with this message. But the only way that sinful men can be made fit for heaven is by having their sins washed away by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the very point the Apostle Paul makes. Over in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul wrote, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein, notice it, He has made us accepted in the Beloved. In other words, in Christ, we are now acceptable to God. Before we were lost, undone, we were sinners. We, we, we were totally uh, depraved morally and, and spiritually. But, but now, 
We are acceptable in the eyes of God. We're acceptable because we're in Christ. And here's what it says about Him. In whom we have redemption. Through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of His grace. And for those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, those who have been born again by faith and made to become a child of God, John chapter 1, verse number 12, their names have now been recorded in that Lamb's book of life and they will receive a glorious welcome into God's heaven. But there's a dark side for that. And I would be less than honest if I did not tell you the other side of it. Here's the other side. Revelation 20, verse number 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. But for those who are saved, what a, what a wonderful hope we have in Christ. What a wonderful hope that we have that, 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 that we have a salvation that one day will allow us to be accepted in the very presence of God and we'll be able, we'll be able to enter in boldly, not through any merit of our own, because we don't have any, but we'll be able to enter into His presence boldly because the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us and washed us of every sin and of every stain. That's the message of the Gospel, isn't it? That's the message of the Gospel. And so it's no wonder the Apostle Paul said, and we spent two weeks dealing with this verse, way back in chapter 1, verse number 12, I am not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And that's the same theme the Apostle Paul now is going to deal with, be dealing with in our text. It's the same theme he's going to be dealing with in our text after plainly illustrating the wicked condition of all men, the, the lost condition, the total depravity of all men. After dealing with all of that, now he's going to show us the, the wonderful truth about salvation. The wonderful truth about salvation. And so I want you to notice a couple of things with me this morning. Number one, let's notice the transition described. The transition described. Romans chapter 1 or chapter 3, verse 21 says, But now, but now. Now, we always need to pay attention to the little words in the Bible. We, we need to pay attention to those little words. We, we need to remember, as someone has well said, that even the largest of doors turns on the smallest of hinges. And, and, so, and so many times as you come through Bible, you find a very small word and, and you think, oh, that's not so important. No, no, it is important. Uh, every word of God is important, even the little ones. And, and so we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention. The, the little word but here simply means now there's going to be a change of thought. There, there's going to be a change of direction. The Apostle Paul has been dealing with the wickedness of mankind. He's been dealing with the depravity of mankind. Jew, Gentile, makes no difference. We're all in the same boat. And so he's been dealing with this terrible situation that all men are faced because they have broken the righteous laws of God. And, 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 and then comes that little word, but. But. And now there's a transition. And we turn from the wickedness of men. And we see letter A, the righteousness revealed. The righteousness revealed. You remember the Apostle Paul had declared in chapter 3 and verse number 19 that the law of God reveals the fact that all men are guilty before God. The law of God reveals the fact of our guilt. The law doesn't save us, it condemns us. Because it shows that we're all guilty before God. And that law reveals the fact that we're guilty. It reveals the fact that God's righteousness and, and that God's holy standards are, are going to be, uh, we're going to be judged by those things. And so, and so the apostle Paul says in verse number 20, by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law is the knowledge of sin. And, and then in verse 21, but now, but now the righteousness of God Notice it, without the law is manifested. 
the righteousness of God without the law. In other words, the righteousness of God is now manifested. It is now seen. It's now revealed. Not in the Old Testament law that was given at Mount Sinai, but now it's seen in the person of Jesus Christ. That's where it's found. That's where it's found. In fact, that's the very thing we find in John chapter 1, verse number 18. Remember the Bible says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Simply means he is, He's made Him known. He's revealed Him to us. How, how do we know what God is like? Look at Jesus Christ. Look at Jesus Christ. There you find the perfect picture of God. And, and so we see the righteousness revealed. Righteousness. True righteousness is seen in the life of Jesus Christ. It's seen in the life of Jesus Christ. Not only do we see the righteousness revealed, we have to notice this, and that's the root identified. The root identified. The idea that the righteousness of God would be revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. That This was not a new concept. It's not a new thing that the Apostle Paul came up with. It didn't start with the Apostle Paul. It didn't start with him. Rather, it's a message that is deeply rooted in the Scriptures of the Old Testament. That's why many times Christians today, they make a terrible mistake when they ignore the Old Testament. They say, well, Old Testament, it's old. I like the new stuff. And so, and so uh, you know, that was for the Jew, but, but you know, I like the New Testament. That's, 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 more, that's more for our day. No, let me tell you something. If you don't have a proper understanding of the Old Testament, the New Testament will never really make sense. It, it, it never really will. And, and, so, and so this thing of, uh, of the righteousness of God being revealed in the person of Jesus Christ, that's something that is deeply rooted in the Old Testament Scriptures. And so, and so the Apostle Paul declared that his, his message had been, note, notice what he says, his, mes oops, his message had been witnessed by the law and the prophets. This message was witnessed by the law and the prophets. Bottom line, you can go through the whole Old Testament and you'll find the person of the Lord Jesus all the way through. You find the person of the Lord Jesus all the way through the Old Testament as the perfect sacrificial lamb. You find how the Lord Jesus is clearly illustrated in all of the sacrifices that were required in the Old Testament. You find how that the person of the Lord Jesus is clearly stated by the prophets. Read Psalm 22. Read Isaiah 53 and a host of other passages, all of them declaring the fact that there is going to come a Messiah and that through Him, men are going to be able to be forgiven of their sin. And they'll be able to made, be made righteous before God. Let her see there's the consequence stated. In verse number 22, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Now I want you to notice the wording there, that little phrase. Unto all and upon all. Key phrase. It's a key phrase. In other words, God's perfect righteousness. It is given to... And it is placed upon. It's given to, it is placed upon everyone who will believe in His Son. That's how salvation works. That, that's how God's salvation operates. In, in, fact, in fact, that is what we find so clearly stated in 2 Corinthians 5.21 where it says, For He, that, that's God the Father, has made Him, that's Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin. He, he had no sin, but He took my sin and He took your sin and, and He took it upon Himself. So He took our sin upon Himself. Why did He do that? So that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That's the transition. That's the transaction. Christ took our sin, paid for it, so that He might then give to us His righteousness. 
His righteousness. Letter D. The necessity reviewed. The necessity reviewed. This is actually a short summary of what we have already seen. The, the necessity of this salvation. He, he's going to give us a short summary of what we've already seen in chapter 1 and in chapter 2. Here, here's the summary. Verse number 22, verse number 23. There is no difference. There is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no difference. It makes no difference who you are. Where you come from. What color your skin is. What language you speak. It makes absolutely no difference how good, sincere, moral, honest you may try to be in your life. It makes no difference. The reality is all of us, all of us are in the same condition. Because all have sinned. That, that little Greek word that is translated all, it, it's an amazing word. You know, what, you know what that word literally means? It literally means all. No exception. All have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. That phrase, come short of the glory of God, it simply means we've missed the mark. We've missed the mark. It's like an archer who pulls back the bow. When we were in the States some time ago, we went to a, uh, we went to a gun shop and, uh, and they had not only pistols and rifles, but they also had bows and arrows and all that kind of stuff. So, so my youngest son, Benjamin, uh, he, he said, man, I'd like to shoot one of those bows. And so the guy said, well, we actually have a range in the back. And, and, and you can go in there and it's enclosed so you know you don't shoot the neighbor or whatever so it, it's all enclosed it's safe and so you, you know you can go back there and try it out so Benjamin said yeah can we do that I said yeah let's do it I want to try too <laughs> and, and so Benjamin gets back there and boy he pulled that thing back boom man he hit the target I, I pulled it back and I hit the wall behind the target okay <laughs> and, and so I thought well that was a little bit too strong so I didn't quite pull it back so far. And, and the arrow, it, it looks so sad going through the air. It went right into the ground. It didn't even make it to the target. Yeah, that's the idea of our righteousness. See, God has a standard. He has a target. He's got a standard that is set. And the problem is, because all of us are sinners, we don't hit the target. We always fall short. And it's even more sad than the arrow that I shot. We miss the mark. That's what it means. That's what it means when it says that all have sinned and come short. And by the way, by the way, the word tense that is used in this passage, the word tense makes it very clear. This is not a one-off problem. It is a continual problem. It is a continual problem. It's not just that we come short occasionally. No, we continually come short. It's constantly we're coming short of God's standard, of what God declares that we are to be. And so the Apostle John, writing to Christians, declared that, it, that if we say, if, if we are so foolish as to say that we have no sin, 1 John 1 8, we are deceiving ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves if we say we have no sin. And if we say we have no sin, 1 John chapter 1, verse 10, we are actually calling God a liar. You know why? Because God said we've all sinned. And if we say we don't have any sin, then we're saying God lied. He didn't tell the truth. He didn't tell the truth. The transition described. I want you to notice number two, the salvation described. The salvation described. Notice it, first of all, in the fruit of it. The fruit of it. Romans chapter 3, verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Here we're introduced to two theological terms. Normally we charge you money to learn this in Heritage Baptist School of Theology, but today I'm going to give it to you free, okay? Here, here we learn two theological terms that are so important. Two theological terms that 
are so precious. And both of them have to do with the doctrine of our salvation. The first word is justified. Justified. It simply means to declare a guilty one not guilty. To declare a guilty one not guilty. Or as one writer has noted, for guilty sinners to be able to stand confidently before a perfectly holy God, get this, just as though they had never sinned. That's what it means to be justified. To be able to stand before God just, just like I never sinned. Just like I never sinned. And we all know that's not true, right? Ask my wife. She'll tell you. We, we've all sinned. And yet, because of Jesus Christ and the salvation that He has made available for us on the cross of Calvary, we have this wonderful privilege of being able to stand before God justified. Just like we never sinned. There's another theological term that we find in this verse, and that's the word redemption. The word redemption. The word redemption simply means to set at liberty one who has been enslaved. And, and how did they set us at liberty? By paying the ransom. In other words, paying the price for our freedom. That's what it means to be redeemed. As sinners, as sinners, uh, all of us were under the condemnation of sin. But because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary, when, when we receive Him as our Savior, God declares us to be righteous. He, he frees us from the condemnation. He frees us from the consequences of the sin that has enslaved us. And, and do not miss the amazing truth that God does all of this. He does all of it. Notice it. Freely. By His grace. That's how it's accomplished. It's accomplished freely. By His grace. It's not something we try to earn. Because you can't earn it. You'll never be good enough to deserve it. It's not something we try to merit by doing certain religious works because there's not enough religious works in the world for us to do to merit or to earn God's salvation. Therefore, God says, I'll let my son pay for it on the cross of Calvary. And by my grace, undeserved, unmerited favor. That's what grace means. By my grace, I give it to you. By my grace, I give it to you. That's why the Bible says this. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved. What, what is it that makes that grace to give us salvation? Well, it's, it's when we believe. It's when we believe. It's by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. And this is all possible. Again, it's all possible when we consider the price of it. When we consider the price of it, Romans 3.25, notice what Paul says here. Whom God, talking about Jesus Christ, whom God hath set forth to be the propitiation. That word propitiation, kind of a big word. But it simply means the full payment. In other words, paid in full. That's what propitiation means. And so through Jesus Christ, God has set forth Him to be a propitiation, to be the full payment. And it comes through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now I want you to notice that when Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary, He paid the price for those, notice the term here, for the sins that are past. For the sins that are past. Now there are some people who have the idea that that means that when we get saved, when we receive Christ as our Savior, that all of the sins of the past are they're taken care of. They're forgiven. They're gone. But, but what about my sins for now and the sins tomorrow and next week, next month, next year? Well, what about those sins? I, I have to pay for those, right? No, no. 
No, you see, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, He put away sin. Sin is not the issue anymore. The issue now is, have you received Christ as your Savior? You see, people don't die, to die and go to hell because they're sinners. They die and go to hell because they rejected Jesus Christ. And He's the propitiation. He's the propitiation for our sins. He paid the price for those sins that are in the past. What, what does that mean? If it doesn't mean what I've already said, then what does it mean? And what it simply means is this. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, not only did He die for my sin and your sin, He also died for the sins of all of those who lived in Old Testament times. He died for their sins as well. And that was necessary. Because the Bible says that it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats would take away sin. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. And so when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He didn't just die for those who would live from that time forward. Even those sins in the past, He paid the price for those as well. J. Vernon McGee in his commentary, I think, said it very well when he said, up to the time when Christ died, God saved men on credit. He saved men on credit. In other words, in obedience to God by faith, men would bring their animal sacrifices and they would offer them there, understanding that the blood of those animals was only covering their sin. And it would only cover their sin for one year. And then they had to offer the same sacrifice over and over and over again. And so the men understood that this was only a covering and it was only good for one year. But they were looking forward by faith to the day when that perfect Lamb of God would come who would die for the sins of the world. And not only would He die for the sins of the world, but He would take them away. He didn't just cover it up. He totally took it away. Totally took it away. That's not all. Concerning the Lord Jesus, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 26, now once in the end of the world hath He appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of Himself. In other words, the Lord Jesus not only died for the sins of the past, but because of what He accomplished on the cross of Calvary. Even we today, even we today are able to say, as it says in verse number 26, we're able to declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness. We're able to declare that. We're able to declare His righteousness, that, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Now, now this raises an interesting question, and the question is this. How could God, how could God maintain His absolute perfect righteousness? And how could He maintain His absolute perfect holiness while showing mercy and grace to wicked undeserving sinners. How, how, those two things don't go together. How could God, how could God do that? And the answer is simply that on the cross of Calvary, the justice that we deserved, it was poured out on Jesus Christ. In other words, as the psalmist said, when Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary, here's what happened. A beautiful picture. Look at it. Psalm 85 Verse number 10. Mercy and truth met together. Mercy and truth met together. Righteousness and peace. They kissed each other. That's the tenderness of the cross of Calvary. And that's why God can be absolutely just while justifying those of us who are unjust because Jesus Christ died for us. Notice letter C, the assurance of it. We as sinful men are declared righteous through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus and by our faith in Him. Not something that is earned, not something deserved. Rather, it is something that was purchased 
by God the Son, and it is freely given by God the Father. And that's why salvation, you see it referred to in the Scriptures, Romans 6.23, for example, and Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 8 and 9, it is referred to as the gift of God. Why? Because it's already bought and paid for. You, you don't have to buy a gift, right? Uh, can you imagine Santa Claus coming down the chimney at Christmas time in your house and saying, ho, 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 anybody want to buy a Christmas present? No, you don't buy gifts. You receive gifts. You buy gifts for somebody else. Jesus Christ paid the price so that that free gift of salvation it might be received by all of those who will believe. In other words, by God's amazing grace through faith in Jesus Christ, sinful men are now made acceptable in the sight of God. And nothing can ever change that status. That's why the Lord Jesus said this in John chapter 6, verse 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And he that cometh to me, I will in no wise, no matter how you may stumble, no matter how you may fall, no matter how many times you may sin, When you come to Jesus Christ, He gives to you that gift of God which is eternal life. And and the wonderful promise is that He will in no wise, under no circumstances, under no condition, will He ever cast you out. The transition described. The salvation described. Number three, very quickly. The consequences described. The consequences. I want you to notice, first of all, there is a prohibition. There is a prohibition. Notice it in verse 27, verse number 28. Wherein is boasting then? (laughs) I mean, stop and think about it. If we're all sinners, and we all deserve eternal damnation, and the only reason we have any hope of eternal life is because of the fact that Jesus Christ took our sin and died in our place, then the question is, what do we have to brag about? And the obvious answer is, nothing. Nothing. Wherein is boasted then? It is excluded. It's excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay. But by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude, here's the conclusion of this whole thing now, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. It's not what we do, it's what He did that makes the difference. Again, the Apostle Paul drives home the point that no man is saved. No man is made righteous in the sight of God by keeping the law. Therefore, no man has any grounds for boasting. Can you imagine how miserable heaven would be? Because you know there would always be some, right? Can you imagine how miserable heaven would be if we all got there by what we did? Can you imagine how miserable it would be you're walking down the streets of gold and somebody comes up and says, oh, what did you do to get here? Let me tell you what I did. Man, I was Mr. Wonderful, you know. I was the pastor at Heritage Baptist Church. You know. No, we're, we're, none of us deserve to be there. The only reason we'll ever get there is because of God's grace that has provided a salvation that we simply received by faith. And therefore, there is no boasting. There is no room for bragging. We have no grounds to boast. The the law of works, no matter how good it may be, no matter how noble it may be, no, no matter how righteous they may appear to be in the eyes of God, the law of works will never satisfy the holy, righteous demands of our God because as we've already seen, all of our works are falling short. They are consistently falling short of the standard, the target that he has set and everyone who's been saved no matter who they are everyone who's ever been saved 
has been saved in the very same way. Been saved in the very same way by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And because of that, because of that, the prohibition is there's no boasting. But because of that salvation, then let her be, there is a relationship. There is a relationship. Notice it in verse 29, verse number 30. Is He the God of the Jews only? See, the Jews believe that. They believe they had, they had the, the they, they believe that God belonged to them. Well, they were God's chosen people, and so, and so they were God's pet. They were God's favorite. They, they had a, they, they had a monopoly on God. So Paul says, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? And I love the answer because I'm a Gentile. By the way, so are you. Get the answer. Yes. Of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision, that is, those Jews who took great pride in their circumcision, He's going to justify the Jews, the circumcision, how? By faith and the uncircumcision. That's the rest of us. And how are they going to be justified? By faith. By faith. There is no difference. There is no difference. Remember the Apostle John wrote concerning the Lord Jesus back in John chapter 1, verse 12. He said, as many as... Boy, that's an open-ended phrase. It applies to everybody. Jew, Gentile, it applies to everybody. As many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on His name. As we come to the end of this chapter, the Apostle Paul is going to end it with a question. And he's not going to leave us hanging there with the question. After, after he gives the question, he's going, he's going to give us an answer. Notice, notice it with me. Verse number 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? In other words, if salvation is by faith and we can't be saved by the law, does that mean that our faith cancels out God's law? Is, is that what it means? And, and then he gives the answer, God forbid. Today we would say, no way. Absolutely not. God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. You remember the Lord Jesus said in His Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 17. He said, think not that I've come to destroy the law. That's, that's not why Jesus came. He didn't come to destroy the law. Rather, He came to fulfill it. He came to fulfill it. And, and, and so it is when we receive Jesus Christ as His Savior and His sweet Holy Spirit takes up residence in our hearts and in our lives and, and, and literally indwells our bodies so that we, we become the temple of the Spirit of God. Sadly, we live in a day when many Baptists are scared to death to talk about the Holy Spirit because they don't want to look like a charismatic. I want to tell you something. We had the Holy Spirit before they did. Don't be scared to talk about the sweet Holy Spirit of God. What a friend He is. What a companion. What a comfort He is. As He leads and guides and directs in our life because the Holy Spirit takes up residence in our life. Here's what's happened. Here's what will happen. His desire will become our desire. That's what will happen. His desire, what He wants in our heart of hearts is going to be what we want. In fact, that's the very reason why. And we're going to see this later on in our study. But let me just let me jump over there real quick. Romans chapter 7, verse 22. That's why Paul said this. He said, I delight in the law of God. Notice where? After the inward man. 
You see, the flesh is still wicked. The flesh still wants to go its own way. The flesh still wants to live in rebellion against God. Even after we get saved, this flesh does not change, but we're changed wonderfully on the inside. And because God's Spirit now lives within us, our desire, our delight is to do God's will and to keep His law on the inward man. In other words, as a child of God, we will have the desire to live a life of obedience. Not an obedience that follows after the lust and the cravings and the desires of of our wicked flesh. But we'll have a desire to live a life of obedience that walks in the pathway of holiness as we ought to walk. That's the truth about salvation. Now the question is this. Have you received it? Have you received it? And if you have received it, are you living it out in such a way that others are able to see the reality of your salvation? They're able to see the reality of your relationship with God. And the way you talk, the way you act, the way you dress, the things you do, are they able to see Christ in that? Are they able to see that from the inside, your greatest desire is to walk in obedience to the Word of God?